A little while ago, I got a homework problem involving spinner spherical harmonics. It consisted of the requirement to prove this identity, which you may or may not have seen before, where these are the formulas for the spinner spherical harmonics of the two different types. I'm not really sure what I expected, but this proved to be a surprisingly difficult task, and in fact it frustrated me enough to motivate me to make a YouTube video showing all of you how to do it to prevent any of you from ever having your day worsened by this particular homework problem if you find yourself in a class where it's assigned. Now, there are really two ways a homework problem, or any problem in mathematical physics, or probably science in general, can be difficult. One is the implementation of the solution. Once you know what to do, it can be quite a lot of work to implement it. In some cases, maybe it's quite tricky to implement it without making a mistake. Um, then the other way it can be difficult is before you even get to implementation, when you're still figuring out what procedure to even use. It can be quite tricky to guess that, and I get the impression that some professors write out the solution to a problem, and they look at what they have in front of them, and it's not that long, and it's not that hard to understand, and this gives them a false sense of easiness and they feel justified in assigning it. However, that tends to cause them to neglect the difficulty associated with the step before that in the process. The simplicity and shortness of what they have in front of them can cause them to underestimate how difficult it is to actually come up with the correct procedure cold. This can be exacerbated by the fact that a lot of professors don't even come up with their own homework problems, so there's not necessarily ever even really a time, at least in recent memory, where they had to just come up with it. My impression is that something like that happened here. But regardless, I'm going to show you how to do it so that at least with this problem, that never happens to you. Now, unsurprisingly, given that spinner spherical harmonics are most simply expressed in spherical coordinates, it's most convenient to also express this applied matrix operator in terms of spherical coordinates. Note that r hat is the radial unit vector, but since the standard Pauli matrices in this context are referred to Cartesian coordinates, we need the Cartesian components of r hat in spherical coordinates, and that can be found simply by ignoring the r factor in the front of the coordinate transformation relations from Cartesian to spherical coordinates, so we just wind up with this. These are, of course, the Pauli matrices plugging all that into the dot product that we need to evaluate, and remembering Euler's identity gets us here. We can then apply that to the spherical harmonics we're starting with. We wind up with these two rather messy components. Now, it's useful to label the upper and lower components separately because in order to get them to turn into the answer that we're looking for, we're going to have to do somewhat different treatments to each of them, and that'll be made easier by denoting them separately. Now, at this point, the key thing to remember is that the theta dependence in spherical harmonics, which we've got in there, is given by the associated Legendre functions with argument cosine theta. We can therefore eliminate the trig functions by applying the right associated Legendre function recurrence relations. The ones that end up giving us the results we need are as follows. For rewriting the terms with the cosine theta factors out front, this one ends up doing the job. For rewriting the terms with the cosine theta factors out front, this recurrence relation gets the job done. For rewriting the term with the sine theta e to the minus i phi factor out front, this one ends up being useful. And for rewriting the sine theta e to the i phi term, this one ends up getting the result we need. Now, this e to the i phi or e to the i minus phi dependence has nothing to do with the cosine theta dependence. But it turns out that applying a different recurrence relation to the two cases anyway ends up being necessary to get it to simplify downright. Now, you may point out that this relation is only true when sine theta is positive. And yeah, you're right, but in spherical coordinates, theta only varies from 0 to pi, and sine theta is positive for that. So we're clear to use these two recurrence relations without thinking about it further. It's important to remind you that the use of these recurrence relations isn't obvious and came from trying different approaches, including ones that didn't even use recurrence relations at all. 
And it's steps like that that really made this time-consuming. Regardless, applying them gives us these key relations, and also these two. The first ones aren't more key, these ones just got bumped to the next page. From here, it's extremely advantageous to keep the math simple and clear by defining specifically these coefficients. You'll see why they end up making things easier later. And now for the final not-so-obvious step. While applying this coefficient definition directly would keep the math compact, there's a somewhat less than obvious way to rewrite the spherical harmonics that we need in terms of them that makes the next step particularly easy. For use in rewriting the upper component, these two formulas here end up being extremely useful, by which I mean the ones on the end here after the last equals sign. And for rewriting the lower component, this formula and this formula end up being useful. The clever parts of this rewrite are that it causes the azimuthal phase factors to explicitly disappear and also allows the C coefficients to be factored out. We end up with these much less scary looking expressions. And now we're ready to apply those recurrence relations that we sorted out earlier. Inserting the ones that we had for the upper component gives us this immediately, which looks horrible, but if you multiply things out in combined like terms, it actually simplifies down massively, and we get a really nice expression here that looks not exactly like what we're going for, but very similar. And we'll see how that ends up working out. But before that, we have to do the lower component. Inserting the recurrence relation formulas that we had sorted out for the lower component immediately gives us this. And again, combining like terms after multiplying everything out gives us a much simplified result. And yet another result that looks similar, but not exactly like what it is that we're going for. To summarize, we have this result so far for the matrix operator in question applied to the minus type spinner spherical harmonics. Now the last step required to get this to look exactly like the plus type spinner spherical harmonics is to remember that the L quantum number doesn't refer to the same value in the minus and plus cases. They refer to these values, which leads to this relationship between them. So if we explicitly denote which kind of quantum number we're dealing with, the result we have up here, of course, just looks like this one. And if we plug in that relation, we get these results. And this is exactly the expression for the plus type spinner spherical harmonics in terms of the corresponding L quantum number. And with that, we've done it. We've finished the homework problem. There were a number of not so obvious and very specific steps that we had to take there in order to get through this problem so cleanly. Anyway, I hope you found this interesting. Thanks for watching.